happening to media in the West. And in the, f the, the fact of the matter is that, yes, the media as we understand it is dying, and I think the traditional media is not going to survive. Um, I think, uh, you know, the case, as the case is in, in the Middle East, we have, you have media, private and public, neither of which really serve the public interest. Those are two very different things, obviously. Um, but as I understand it, in Tunisia and in Egypt, the majority of people still rely on sort of the state-run TV, state-run radio as the sort of main source of news. But as sort of, you know, the model changes, where do you think, I mean, where do you see it going? The internet penetration rates aren't as high in the Middle East as they are in the West. So what is the kind of the model of media access that you think is going to emerge in the Middle East? Thank you for uh, asking our two panelists as well. And last question, the man with the, yeah. yeah. Ahmed Han. Uh, well, I am coming from a strange country, you know. We, we are a democracy, uh, by the way. I have to underline that. Uh, and in that democracy, when the Gezi protests started, the protests in Taksim started, the main media outlets, not even the pro-pro-government ones, because there is really the distinction is between the pro-government news outlets and the pro-pro-government news outlets. Even the pro-government news outlets had penguins, documentaries showing penguins on TV. And that was uh, the, the local subsidiary of CNN. Uh, whose uh, owner has been fined uh, at a rate of $3 billion for tax evasion on uh, very murky grounds. I don't, I'm, I'm not very much favorable of the guy himself, but uh, the, the fine itself is an exemplary one. Uh, the second thing was uh, I'm also coming from a democracy where the uh, regulating authority, the head of the execution, uh, said that Twitter and social media was the mother of all evil because uh, three, two million people has tweeted 15 million tweets while organizing Gezi Park movements. And then after that, in that democracy, the government, led by the prime minister, of course, gathered together authorities from A, national intelligence agency, a key, uh, to, uh, B, public security regulation coordination undersecretary, it's something that is, wow. And uh, Turkish radio television uh, and whatnot together to avoid exactly things like Gezi from occurring again. So when you're speaking about regulation, ah, of course there are side stories to that. You can, uh, you can just make people take over media outlets uh, if they are pro-government by subsidizing them with loans through uh, public banks at a rate of $850 million and then fire news, uh, news journalists. Well, it is not even an SMS, you know. If you go out there and if you're powerful Please enough as my dear there. Prime Minister is, if you just go out there and say that you did not like a particular article, you're sure that the, the journalist will be fired the next day. So under those conditions, and remember that this is a democracy, a NATO member, a member of European uh, Council on Human Rights, a, a, a negotiating whatever partner, however you name it, uh, with, 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 uh, with the EU. So if this is the situation there, regulation is something allergic to me, and I cannot imagine how the Arab friends here uh, might be feeling about it. So you have to be really very careful about when you're talking about regulating this. And did I mention that Turkey is a democracy? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to Lina and Ziet. Who would the answer of you? Are you sure? Who of you will answer to the question? <clears throat> okay, thank you. I want to ask you know, وسائل الاعلام التقليديه وخاصه منها العموميه التي كانت تستخدم كادوات للدعايه لفت الانظمه السابقه كانت تستخدم كادوات حكوميه وليس كادوات عموميه للاعلام لم يكن كل العاملين فيها منخرطين في هذا الدور بل بالعكس هناك قله كانت مستفيده من النظم السابقه وكانت هي التي تلعب دور مقابل اغلبيه كانت مضطره للصمت 
لان الكلام كان سيؤدي بها الى ما لا يحمد عقباه وكانت تعاني من الحرمان من عقد الحرمان والالطيات ما حصل بعد ان تحرر التغييرات الحاصلة في بلداننا بعد ان تحررت البلدان تحرر كذلك الاعلام ومنها الاعلام العمومي وبالتالي تحررت هذه الاغلبية التي كانت محرومة من انقلام بواجبها لما سنحت لها الفرصة اصبحت تقوم بهذا الدور ولذلك تمكنت من ان تشد المواطنين اليها خاصة وانها تتوفر على عناصر عندها مهنية وعندها احترافية ليست متوفرة في وسائل الاعلام الجديدة هذا فني من ناحية من ناحية ثانية وسائل الاعلام الجديدة في جزء كبير فني منها تم احداثها من قبل من لهم المال ومن لهم المال والسلطة هم اساسا الحكام الجدد فالمفارقة ان الجزء الكبير من وسائل الاعلام الجديدة تم احداثها من قبل اذا الموالين للحكام الجدد فاصبحت هي التي تلعب الدور القديم الذي كان يلعبه الاعلام الحكومي اي دور الدعاية لفات الحكام وليس دور السعي الى الحقيقة اما وسائل الاعلام المستقلة التي انتجتها الحرية فهي تعاني كثيرا من غياب الامكانيات وللاسف فان العديد منها نتيجة الصعوبات لم يستطع ان يواصل مع الاشارة الى وجود تأثير لرأس المال الخليجي هناك رأس مال فني خليجي يلعب دور تخريبي على جميع المستويات في بلدي على الاقل ولا اتحدث عن تجارب الـ 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 الاخرين ملاحظة فقط بالنسبة لزميلي الـ الـ السوري السوشيال ميديا او شبكات التواصل الاجتماعي رغم الانحرافات التي حصلت فيها لكنها مع ذلك ما زال لها دور تلعبه فهي اولا تلعب دور المحفز لوسائل الاعلام التقليدي عندما يغفل او يغف هذا الاعلام فهي من تدفعه الى ان يستفيق ويتابع الحدث ثانيا بحكم ارتباطها بالقرب فهي كذلك تكون احيانا مصدر لوسائل الاعلام التقليدية كل ما نقوم به عندما ينشر شيء في الانترنت هو الان ان واذا رأينا انه مهم اننا نرسل محررين على عين المكان حتى يقوموا بالتغطية وبالتالي ما زال لهذا الاعلام دور يلعبه مشكلته فقط سوري مشكلتنا فقط مع هذه الجيوش التي تخدم كادوات للاستبداد I try to be brief. Um, um, I don't have an answer for, for the question of the roadmap or the future because currently there is a deep crisis, as, as I said before, and it's really a business crisis more than anything else. Um, uh, media enterprises in the Arab world, and I think by and large the whole world, cannot uh, really depend on the paychecks of uh, this investor or that investor without a sustainability model, and no one is trying to invest in a sustainability model. I dare to say that, you know, I'm trying to play the game differently just because I lost my job for the last decade and a half as a journalist repeatedly in different institutions because the institution is going bankrupt. So I'm trying to start my own with the very basic ex exercise of an enterprise, which is to write a business model and we'll see it where it goes. <laughs> but but uh, but I don't I don't see um, where particularly in Egypt the private media is going to go because what is do what it is doing right now is that it's reproducing the functions of the state media in acting as um, a PR machine for uh, the current regime and and people have already divorced themselves from the state media for that very reason they are they started cultivating for the last decade. Um, an aversion to state media not being, um, you know, not being objective, not being vehicle of the truth and all that. And currently with the private media reproducing these functions, I don't see um, how they can sustain themselves really. They need to like return to the ranks of the civil society and contentious politics or else um, I think they'll be doomed. And just a very quick note on uh, the two points. Uh, the one was regards to the internet regulation. I also have to I also have to say that I shivered when I, when I heard that. Um, on a more conceptual level, I think um, we should understand the internet as something that is unsettling um, the, our, our understanding of political culture in general and trying to um, uh, manipulate that I think is very uh, dangerous. And you know, just 
you know, um, a food for thought, think of how Wikipedia has been self-managing itself for the last few years, right? It's not an idealistic model, it's not a utopia, and utopias are dysfunctional anyways, but it's a very interesting model of um, self-management online without any, you know, external regulators or anything like that. And then finally, with regards to uh, the journalism dooming and all that, I mean, I have to be aversive to that because that's my job, right? So I, if you say this, I'll end up doing nothing and I don't have anything else to shift to. So I'll have to defend that, but not on the, not just for, uh, the inevitability of me continuing to be a journalist, but also because analysis itself cannot replace journalism, as you said. And, you know, a very good example of that is, again, the Arab Spring and how I see it, the, when it came, it actually crystallized um, a very deep analytical failure in the, in the sense that, you know, no one expected it, no one understood it at the beginning, and, you know, as it was coming, a lot of books have been already, were already being published or in the path of being published about authoritarian regimes and their sustainability and their strength and so on and so forth. So um, I think there, there, you cannot compensate the presence um, uh, that the journalists uh, or, you know, some journalists provide when they are trying to portray what's happening. Presence, I think, is, an, a, very is a very important thing that cannot just be compensated by analysis. Thank so. you very much. I know that uh, you're criticizing of a censorship, but please bear in mind that we, uh, with extending the time and entering the time of the next panel, we are censoring, uh, uh, we are censoring them. So um, I'm sure that maybe you're starving, and I hope that we've provided... No, I'm really... Sorry, I'm really sorry. You can ask her later. I mean, you can speak to all the panelists if they agree. Не получих отговор на моя въпрос. Това е цензура от Москвото. Окей, окей, окей. Имаме в България една специална ситуация. Имаме една партия в парламента. Сега трябва да обясна малко повече, за което се извинявам на следващия панел, но трябва да е ясно на гостите какъв е въпроса на Мухамед. За съжаление, в българския парламент има една партия, която използва тежката ситуация, която се намира в страната ни, политическа и економическа криза. Към България в момента има много силна беженска вълна. Цялата тази ситуация е използвана от тази партия за разпространяване на ксенофобски и а, други тенденции, свързани с а, в никакъв случай противоречащи директно на, на демократичната и, и европейските принципи, които тази държава, България, сама за себе си избрала и я поставила. Има една депутатка от тази партия, която е депутат в Българското народно събрание, която отива в различни телевизионни студия и говори по адрес на беженците, които идват в България от а, различни държави. Те идват от Сирия, идват от Афганистан, идват от Сомалия, откъде ли не търсят, търсят помощ. И тя говори измислени и, 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 и гадни неща, които обаче а, намират почва бързо. И вие всеки от вас го познава в собствената си държава. Има такива случаи, има такива казуси. Мухавет сега ме призовава да кажа своето мнение по въпроса и аз ще го кажа ясно пред всички вас. За мен а, тази жена трябва да върне мандата си като депутат веднага. Тази телевизия се намира под мониторинг от съвета за електронни медии. На нея си наложени санкции и в момента вървят процедури. Вие няма как да знаете дали са наложени санкции или не ли са, защото това е демократичната процедура в такава държава. Налагаш санкция, тя обжалва в съда, докато санкцията влезе в сила, но нямайте съмнение, че санкции са наложени. Uh, really lunch, sort of coming towards the end of this, to this end, please. Hello? Okay, well, I will presume that whoever is interested in listening to this panel has already taken their seat, so I will make a start. Uh, normally, the session after lunch is one of the more difficult ones. Uh, 
Uh, however, I think today we are rather privileged in the fact that we have three excellent speakers uh, and we have almost half, a, well, an hour and a half, which means that, you know, we're not going to be rushing through their presentations. And uh, I will suggest that, you know, each one of them takes a quarter of an hour. Uh, so that they have plenty of time to make their to make their points, and then of course we can we can have a, a, an open discussion. Uh, I am not really the type of moderator who tries to set out a larger framework for the for the presentation. Uh, so uh, especially in the context of the issues that we are discussing in this panel, because clearly there are so many angles uh, which we can uh, which we can take on this. Uh, you know, we can start looking at the big picture, we can start looking at how politically things are evolving in the, uh, in the region, we can, we can you know, have a, a discussion about policy instruments, soft power, I mean, there are all these many possible uh, approaches. So I'm, you know, I'm not going to be selecting any one of those, uh, sort of hoping that we can sort of, you know, start guiding ourselves towards these issues in the context of the uh, of the discussions and sort of leave that choice to our panelists. Um, so, you know, without really, you know, speaking any further, I would you know, give the floor to Mrs. Postovova uh, and ask her to make her presentation, please. Thank you, Chair. It's a great pleasure to be here in this distinguished uh, public today. Um, as you have seen, uh, maybe already from the documentation, I had the privilege to be deputy head of our European Union delegation in Cairo for three years. Uh, I went there just before the revolution started. I uh, lived you, uh, through the revolution and uh, I actually left when El Sisi took, retook the power. So at present I am the head of the European Union delegation in Libya another very challenging country. So I would like to kick off that discussion uh, from the point of view how the European Union engages in this region, because it's a very important region. Why? Because these are the nearest neighbors to Europe. And this is extremely important, not only because of our good partnership, which, which we want to develop, like internal market and development in all sectors of life, but most because of the problems which also are raised with this close, um, close uh, geographical position. Very recently you saw the, the terrible accidents and the no, terrible tragedy actually, Lampedusa 1 and 2. You see the migration flows which are entering into Europe. So it is not only uh, the positive side, but there is also a very big negative side. So saying all that, uh, I would like to make a comparison, starting by a comparison, how the European Union engaged in our countries. Uh, in the Western Balkans, in the Central uh, European countries when the enlargement process was going. It was very different and the instruments which the European Union used then, unfortunately, are not applicable for the MENA region. Why? Because our countries, including the Western Balkan countries, with which now the negotiations are ongoing, we all and they had the clear perspective to become one day a European member state. So, of course, the negotiations in such a framework are very different when you have partners who do not want to become members. We are never going to see Egypt a member of the European Union. There is a Statut Avancé with Morocco, but this is very different. And Libya even doesn't want now to start any uh, legislative relations with the European Union. So what I want to say is that our relations with the, this region is based on the so-called partnership agreements. These partnership agreements are very different from what we expected in the uh, enlargement process and the instruments which we use now are very different as well. Uh, we have the European Neighbourhood Policy uh, instruments and uh, our distinguished um, speaker, Yeji, is going to tell you about the endowment of democracy, which is one of that uh, instruments. We have as well um, instruments like the instrument for stability, because most of these countries, unfortunately, are in crisis and we have to deal with security issues. We have uh, funds which are thematic and which are for civil society, for human rights, but they are very much more limited than those which were in the enlargement policy. So in this environment, I would like to share some experience how we engaged in this region. 
uh, we have always had cooperation. Nevertheless, that the regimes were, we call them now, totalitarian. And that's true. They are totalitarian, Mubarak, Gaddafi. Uh, nevertheless, the European Union chose never to be isolated from this region. Why? First, because of the close uh, geographical position of the region. And second, because the people who are living, the citizens in these countries, we wanted to target them. We did not want to help Gaddafi, we did not want to help Mubarak, but we wanted to support the civil society which was starting to grow even under Mubarak time.